short time uh, we have available, I wanted to cover a couple of quick topics. I want to update our friends from abroad and, and local people here about current developments in the startup nation. How are we doing? What are the trends? I then want to talk about the role of the Israel innovation story in terms of our foreign policy and our position among the nations. And then finally, I want to make some comments about the newest wave of democratization and of uh, call it uh, freedom-inducing activity in the innovation finance area, which is crowdfunding. And uh, in lieu of the recent SEC decision on uh, Friday last week, what, what implications that has both for Israel and elsewhere. So just a quick update. Um, the business here, the tech business is on fire. There's never been a better time to be a tech investor, entrepreneur, or company in Israel. We were doing really well before, now, literally, we are going off the charts. So in 2013, there was about $2.2 billion invested in Israeli startups. Good number. Relative to countries that are sort of our size, like Chile, with 17 million people, they have about $65 million invested. Israel had $2.2 billion at that uh, time in 2013. Australia, by the way, has about $200 million invested. Israel, again, 2.2 billion. 2013 to 2014 is that the number went from 2.2 billion to 3.4 billion, which is a growth of 46%. Any of you who are businessmen and know what happens in a year to year where you grow 46%, it's pretty damn good. But what happens this year is we're going to 5 I billion. Too many numbers at you. We went from 2.2 billion in 2013 to 5 billion this year. That's more than doubling a very, very good business. That is now 25 times the investment in Australia, which is three times our size. So Israel makes sense. Invest 75 times per capita venture capital in Australia. It means that basically what's happening here in this country now is we are the other leg of this tech duopoly which is Silicon Valley, and I'm not saying America because it's really Silicon Valley and Israel. Everybody else is eating our dust. And what's happening is that the gap between Israel and the rest of these other so-called centers of innovation is, is lengthening. Our business is getting better. There are a lot of factors involved. We can't spend too much time on it, but just start with the fact that, number one, many of our entrepreneurs who are starting companies are not doing it for the first time. These are serial entrepreneurs. What they do is this for a living. They're on startup three, four, five. And many of them have not just had the failures which build future success, but they've had success after success after success. The multinational corporations who are buying these companies by and large are swooping into Israel like never before. There are now 350 different multinationals who operate R&D centers here in the country, joined recently by the likes of Apple Computer, who has built their second largest R&D center, or Amazon, who is doing cloud research in the country, joining the Googles and the Facebooks and the Ciscos. The biggest daddy of them all, of course, is Intel. The joke is that you know, we should basically be asking Intel for a little sign that says Israel inside, but uh, Intel counters by saying, no, on our menorah, we should put a label that Intel is inside because today Intel represents 10% of Israel's exports, 10%. Intel employs over 10,000 people in the country. They just announced a $6 billion further investment in the country literally two weeks after the war ended last year. Our companies are continuing to go public and represent a huge block of traded companies in New York. The latest big hero is a local town hero called Mobileye. How many of you have heard of this company? Okay, you all should hear about it. Go afterwards back to Google, look at Mobileye. This is a company which is powering the autonomous driving revolution. We all hear about being able to take a jacuzzi in the car instead of you driving, okay? Well, that's gonna be Israeli technology. I'm not sure about the jacuzzi and the bubbles, but certainly the ability for the car to see where it's going, that's what's gonna be coming from Jerusalem. This company went public in the middle of the last war in July despite the fact that many of the bankers had cautioned patience. If those of you who know Israel know that's not our strong suit. Um, and bottom line is that company traded up 50% on its first day of trading and today trades for a market cap of $11 billion. 
So what's happening now with this $5 billion, and to give you a sense of how to, how to really grasp its importance, is that for the first time, the money being invested in venture capital in private enterprise is now larger than all of the US military aid and all of the charity that is collected for this country. In fact, it's approaching double each of those numbers. So when you look and you say, well, Israel has been you know, grown and benefited hugely by this very necessary military aid in the meantime, and by the largesse and the philanthropic expression of love of, of people of all kinds for Israel. Today, the core is investment with great return in Israel's tech sector. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is wh what kind of an impact this is having on Israel's position in the world. And it turns out a massive impact. Right now, we're seeing a rise of Asian interest in Israel like never before. The joke is that they're opening up a third customs line at uh, Ben Gurion Airport in addition to the traditional red and green. This will be red plus for Chinese investors who are coming in with very, very large sums of money. This year, of the $5 billion invested in the country, the estimates are close to a billion dollars will be Chinese money. But it's not just the big Chinese companies and the big venture funds and the big PE, it's individual Chinese who are investing. And it's not just China, it's countries, for example, by the way, just a, a great quote, the Chinese vice premier was here recently and in a moment of extreme clarity was asked, well, how do you explain China's warming attitude towards Israel? And she said, well, in the past, we took a pro-Arab position because of oil, quote. Today, we take a neutral position because of technology, which I think neutral's just fine, um, and we'll, 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 we'll stay with that. Turns out that this year, we had the first ever visit of a Japanese prime minister in the country. Never before a Japanese prime minister come to Israel. The reason they came is because of technology. Look at his schedule and you'll see that he spent about 75% of his time and effort here on technology. Prime Minister Modi from India is coming to Israel shortly. Think he's going to talk about the Balfour Declaration? He's going to talk tech. I am getting uh, on a plane for early next week to go to countries that don't accept our passport okay, our Israeli passport, but they will accept Israelis under other guys because they want to do business. Go take a flight sometime from Ben-Gurion to Amman and see what happens when the guys who have yarmulkes on like me take off the yarmulkes or just put on a baseball cap. It's not like we're fooling anybody, okay? Growth in trade between Israel and the Arab world is extraordinary. And, you know, one has to doesn't do much more than just simply refer to the recent news about a potential deal for Iron Dome in the Gulf, which I think would be a wonderful, great thing, both for our economy and our strengthening ties. Read the interview from Prince Al-Walid last week, a seminal interview in public, not denied at all, where he called for an increasing Saudi-Israel alliance, okay, based, and he said some unbelievable things. And so I think that much of this is geopolitical, but much of this is technology call it technology diplomacy, where people sense that Israel's role in the world in terms of innovation and creating the next big thing is so intense that no matter what kind of boycott crap, okay, is out there talking the nonsense of BDS, they're coming to do business with us. And this is happening despite last year's war or this year's stabbings. It simply is an unstoppable wave. And if you look at the BDS people and what they tried to do, the couple of events that really were sort of seminal in the last couple of months, well, you can look at what happened to Matissiahu, for example, in Spain, where they couldn't even stop Matissiahu from you know, playing at a rock concert. But look at what happened with the CEO of Orange, who was rumored to be considering BDS. He was here within a week of this announcement in the prime minister's office apologizing, asking, sorry, we didn't mean it. Why would you even think this is possible? And subsequent to this, Orange has been announcing investment after investment after investment in the Israeli economy. And finally, we are becoming very much so a source of pride and inspiration for young entrepreneurs. In the last couple of weeks, I've been in Santiago, Chile, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I can't tell, I've been in New York, obviously, Hong Kong, other places, but I can't tell you how many of these people look to us for inspiration. When I was in 
Brazil, the biggest question is how do you guys do it where you can set up a company in a day? I hear that our member of Knesset here is chairing a committee to remove barriers to uh, technology innovation. As far as I'm concerned, we have no barriers. I'd like to hear about them. I, I just generally want the government out of our business as much as possible. The farther away, the better. I believe in that uh, fiddler on the roof scene where they ask the Rebbe, you know, at the wedding scene, Rebbe, is there a blessing for the Tsar? And he says, yes, may God bless and keep the Tsar far, far away from us. Okay, and the bottom line is if we can keep the government out of our business and leave us with the important business of building companies, that's great. And they, they asked, they said, how do you guys actually set up a company in a day? Because in Brazil, it takes today about 200 or 250 days to set up a company. You can't fire people. You can't close companies. Ever tried to fire somebody in France? It's not doable. So how do you build a, st a startup tech economy, okay, where the government is preventing you from doing this stuff? And finally, last but not least, and we'll take some questions, I want to talk about crowdfunding. And it turns out that what's going on in the moment in the world of tech investment and innovation funding is that the smart money is beginning to realize that all of the value is being created when these companies are private. The big companies that you hear about today, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, et cetera, they stay private. They can get 50 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion dollar valuations. They can even get some liquidity and they don't go public. So there's a big article just a week ago called IPO No. That there's a drought of IPOs on Wall Street because companies are staying private. Now what does that mean for the rest of us and for most funds in the world? They're literally being left out because there is an oligarchy that controls the funding of tech startups, maybe 50 or 100, 150 funds who get all the good deals, and maybe a few hundred well-connected angel investors. The rest of you, forget about it. This gentleman here might have $100 million of net worth. I hope you do. And he picks up the phone and he calls Sequoia Capital or calls Andreessen Horowitz in California and says, let me in, I'd like to write a $5 million check. You don't even get to speak to a secretary. You don't get put on a waiting list. There is no waiting list. Your money's not necessary or wanted. I can't tell you how many billionaires have come to me and said, I can't get these tech deals. So what's happening now is that we are going to break a wedge into this ability to make great returns in private companies through the, the beauty of crowdfunding. Now crowdfunding is now undergoing all kinds of regulatory reform. Last Friday, the SEC finally voted something called Title III of the Jobs Act, which was passed in spring of 2012, which legalizes broad-based crowdfunding. What I do at our crowd is we do crowdfunding for accredited investors. So unfortunately, it's at the moment only for wealthy people. In this country, the law, which does need change, okay, today determines that a person who has less than a net worth of 14 million shekels can't invest. And that's absurd. Right? In other words, you have to basically have 14 million shekels of net worth before you can invest in a startup. Not, not workable. Now, in the U.S., the minimum is a little more normal. It's a million dollars of net worth outside of your primary dwelling or $200,000 of income. But as of Friday, the SEC is now making it open to everybody, where everybody can invest in these kinds of companies up to 5% of your annual income. The dilemma is how do you protect the common public investor in these very risky, not yet public companies who don't have a lot of disclosure, a lot of track record, audited statements, et cetera. So they're doing, I think, important work. There are lots of issues around how crowdfunding is going to evolve, but my intent is to make Israel a world power in this. We today at our crowd are one of the two leading platforms, another platform in Silicon Valley called AngelList, and us are the two biggest in the world. We're doing it from Israel. We've invested so far $170 million in a little over two years. That's not a fund sitting earning interest. That's deployed into 80 different companies, and we're just on a roll. And you're going to hear a lot more about crowdfunding, and hopefully as the laws change, both you here in Israel and those abroad will be able, through the wonders of the World Wide Web, to join our 10,000 investors and begin to really make history with uh, Israeli technology and other technology startups. So again, I want to congratulate people from Heritage and
the leaders uh, summit for what you're doing. I'm definitely uh, uh, part of the, 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 the tribe and the, and the belief that somehow if we simply unleash entrepreneurial spirit, get government the heck out of our business, okay, and let us go ahead and do what we need to do, that will provide an engine for economic growth and for continued wealth creation. Thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful to hear about the opportunities. Uh, and I love the sort of Jeffersonian slant. What we've got here is, is uh, uh, limited government and free markets and entrepreneurialism, uh, and that's wonderful to hear about. Uh, the one question I would put to you, do you have, do you think Israel has a sufficient body of skills and education to feed this? Are you going to run out of people who are capable of doing these things? Right. We, we are running out. We, are, we need more geeks. So send us your kids and your, your cousins. Okay, we need, we need, for those who don't speak tech talk, that means we need tech people. Now, the government, thank God, just a week ago passed a new rule, which is a startup visa. Because we have a policy here which has prevented non-Jews from easily joining this revolution. And we need, just the way that we import farm workers, right? Most modern countries import farm workers. And we have thousands and thousands of foreign farm workers. But we can't import technology workers? We can't bring Indian and Chinese smart engineers to come here? Well, the government's changing its policy. And so the government has just decided to invite startup people to come create their companies in Israel. And we need them from all over the world. They admire us, let them come. Okay, and open up that immigration policy because there's a worldwide contest for bringing this brain power. Now, we have three underrepresented groups in this society who need to be brought in to this technology picture. Number one, the largest group is women. It turns out that 85% of the degrees in this country in engineering and computer science and physics go to men. Women are not taking part. In Silicon Valley, 7% of the venture partners are women. This is a worldwide problem. We've got to get women in. The second problem is Israeli Arabs not participating according to their appropriate numbers in this. We have to bring them in. And finally, the most important and fastest growing demographic group are Israeli Haredim, our ultra-Orthodox brethren here who are simply not being trained in school with the right kind of skills to go participate and need to be brought in big time. They've got great minds. They need to join this revolution. But we are certainly running out of people. Labor costs are going up because we simply don't have enough people to fill the companies. Thank you very there much. There are companies Steve. here who are literally changing the world every day without you having a clue. If you understand why 350 multinationals are here, it's because they're buying our early companies and then continuing the research. So the iPad, for example, has all of its memory modules, many of them developed here. Microsoft Connect, which is that wonderful game that will abuse your kids' minds and just have tremendous you know, fun playing, that gesture recognition developed here. Okay, if you look at the firewall, which is the basic element of uh, network security, invented by a company called Checkpoint, here. The bottom line is anybody really wants to boycott Israel, you have to unhook the internet, because God forbid, <laughs> You know, you know, God forbid you should use a Cisco product or a Google product. You shouldn't go on Facebook because those guys are all over this place. You shouldn't ever use Intel, okay? That means throw away your, your computers. You can't use Qualcomm because they're here. It means get rid of your cell phones. So the bottom line is that right now, a lot of the stuff you use in America, you think is red, white, and blue, but you scratch a little deeper and the bottom layer is, is blue and white. And it's that partnership that really works. Um, today, for example, in Boston, where we've actually done some uh, research, a group called Sachs recently released a research paper. They found 200 Israeli companies active in Boston, and these companies are producing $12 billion of economic activity in just the Massachusetts area, which represents about 3% of the Massachusetts GDP. And if you've been to Massachusetts lately, they are no slouch. In terms of economy, they have a vibrant tech economy, but a huge chunk of it is coming from Israel. And this is happening all over America. It looks like the, there's a, a, a foot race in Vermont, by the way, for who is the largest private employer. Is it Ben & Jerry's or is it uh, Plasan, a, a company that makes armor to keep U.S. military forces safe coming from Kibbutz Sasa? If you look at Georgia, 
There are hundreds of millions of dollars being invested by an Israeli company called Caesar Stone, okay, making marble countertops, not so techy, but pretty neat, beautiful stuff, and employing hundreds of employees. You look at Teva, our company, which leads the world in generic pharmaceuticals, it's now a $100 billion market cap. It employs thousands of people in America and makes all American uh, uh, health bills and health care much more cost efficient because of their generic drugs. They weren't so popular among big pharma, but they're awfully good. And so there's a huge impact. But what I'm interested in is what's coming down the pike. There are products such as uh, a product called Surgical Theater, which is a, a, a joint collaboration between Israeli flight simulation guys in Cleveland together with Case Western Reserve. They're basically building flight simulators for neurosurgeons. So God forbid the next time your neurosurgeon's opening you up, he'll have been inside before and have done simulation the way a, a fighter pilot pra you know, practices for his run. If you look at a company called Consumer Physics, the makers of SIO, SIO is a little device about half this size that is a mass spectrometer in your pocket. And it will tell you how many calories are in the steak or did somebody put roofies in your drink while you went to the bathroom? Or is that lead going into your child's mouth in that paint that came from a Chinese toy? And literally, this is going to change everything. There are companies like CropX who are uh, essentially revolutionizing the way of, of irrigation. They're building smartphone apps that will let you control irrigation so you can save 30 or 40 percent of the water usage. I mean, Israel's leadership in water is, is legendary. Today we recycle 85% of our water versus the best other country is Spain with 17%. California recycles only 5% of its water, and there is none. We're a net water exporter. How did that happen? And the answer is technology. So whether it's in ag tech or in water or in communications or cybersecurity or robotics, one of our favorite companies is a company called Rewalk which went public last year. This is a company that makes a real live exoskeleton. And it's not called Stark Enterprises, right? It doesn't fly on you, but you strap it on and you get up out of your wheelchair and you walk again. And it's a miracle. So this kind of technology, which we're developing here, which we partner with America, where we create American jobs, it's this partnership between our freedom-loving countries, which is an inspiration to the entire world. And it's really the, and I'm glad finally we're getting some good news. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Okay.